Hi everyone, I'm Aisha Kaza for PCR Online and uh, we're bringing you the interventional perspective of late-breaking clinical trials being presented at the ACC. To this end, I'm delighted to have with us today Dr. Rasha Lamy and Dr. Mike Foley from Imperial College London. Rasha is the chief investigator of the Orbiter Cosmic Trial and Mike is the first author of its simultaneous publication in The Lancet. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, so perhaps we could start off with uh, the design paper of Orbiter Cosmic was published in uh, your intervention earlier this year. Perhaps you, we could tell us what this trial set out to answer, what question it set out to answer, the population it uh, targeted in terms of enrollment and uh, the endpoints, the main endpoints. Right. So Orbiter Cosmic is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of the coronary sinus reducer. Um, and it's set out to answer two the unanswered questions. The first is what is the placebo controlled impact of the coronary sinus reducer on myocardial ischemia, which might advance our understanding of the mechanism of the coronary sinus reducer, which is currently uncertain. And the second key aim was to look at the placebo controlled effect of the coronary sinus reducer on angina. Um, so the patient population we looked at are the same population where who have been studied previously and for whom it's recommended in some of the clinical guidelines. So that's patients with epicardial coronary artery disease uh, myocardial ischemia, angina on the maximum tolerated antianginal medication, and no further options for revascularization. Um, so it was a one-to-one uh, -one randomization to coronary sinus reducer or a placebo procedure, and we used the orbiter randomization protocol, so randomization in the cath lab with auditory isolation and a deep level of pharmacological conscious sedation. And our Two primary outcomes, the primary study outcome, which was an imaging outcome, was stress myocardial blood flow, so quantified myocardial blood flow on MRI at follow-up. And the primary symptom outcome was angina episodes reported on a dedicated smartphone application, very similar to the smartphone application used in Orbiter 2. Fabulous. Thank you. Why don't you tell us what the results of the study were then? So the, the, the key results of the study is firstly that um, the coronary sinus reducer did not lead to an improvement in stress myocardial blood flow in segments which were designated ischemic at enrollment. Um, interestingly, there was an improvement in subendocardial perfusion, one of our secondary endpoints, which is another hypothesized mechanism of the device. But importantly, the coronary sinus reducer did improve angina frequency compared with placebo. And that was an effect which took 10 weeks to emerge and was sustained until six month follow up. That's very interesting. I mean, studies set out to look at uh, explaining a mechanistic impact of the coronary sinus reducer, which it apparently did not, but there's a symptomatic benefit. How do you interpret or sort of explain these results to the community? Well, I, th I think that um, certainly what cosmic isn't the final word in this space, and there are, I think it's generated as many questions as it has answers. The, the first thing to say is that we have found an improvement in subendocardial perfusion, which is one of the hypothesized mechanisms of this device. Now, we're the first placebo-controlled trial to try and address these mechanistic questions, and we have more information now than we did at, at the start of the trial. Um, I think the, the, the symptom data uh, tells us, firstly, that I think we have, a, we have reliable data that there's a placebo-controlled treatment effect with the coronary sinus reducer. The time course of the treatment benefit also tells us something about the mechanism, because unlike PCI, where in Orbiter 2, we saw an immediate and sustained symptom improvement with PCI, that's not what we see with the coronary sinus reducer. There was no difference between the groups for the first 10 weeks of blinded follow-up, but then a treatment effect started to emerge, and that was sustained until six months, which suggests something about the way this, the, the, this device works. But I think there are lots of unanswered questions in this space. No, absolutely. That's, that's actually very interesting. So... What's next? Um, what do you reckon will be the next question uh, that you might set out to answer on in this space of refractory angina with the use of a coronary sinus reducer? Yeah, so, I mean, I think you all, as with many of our studies, as Mike said, we end up with kind of more questions to answer. The first step, I think, for Orbiter Cosmic is to try and understand these MRI endpoints more. And obviously, we're going to follow on with a secondary analysis that really deep dives into what happened on MRI. I think the other thing that's important to understand is there's probably, as there always is, a spectrum of effect. And there will be some patients who respond best to the coronary sinus reducer and others who maybe didn't see the same response. 
And we would like to look at and we will see whether there are any predictors of MRI benefit or symptom response. And that's what I think we'll come next with. And then I think there's a wider question as to whether there's a cosmic two. Uh, and we're already thinking about what the questions are for Cosmic 2, um, because as you know, Aisha, we like to, if the trial doesn't fully answer the question, we think of the next trial that might, and we'll see if we need to build on this trial with another trial. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a Cosmic 2 and looking at specific subsets of patients, because as, as you said, there really are more unanswered uh, questions than answers arising from it. So how would you, what have we learned in terms of the mechanism, so to speak, which is one of the main things that the trial set out to do, which was different from the other coronary sinus reducer trials. Well, the the evidence supporting the mechanism of action have come from some really quite historical data now. The initial surgical technique in the early 20th century, which was a coronary sinus ligation technique um, from Claude Beck, um, and then some later animal experiments, which were experiments in the setting of myocardial infarction with, again, coronary sinus obstruction. And these were sort of experiments, unblind experiments, which suggested that there might be a redistribution of perfusion. And that's also been suggested from unblinded single arm registries of patients. I think it's really important when we're looking at mechanism that we're conscious of the biases that can be introduced if you're looking at things in that way. And I think the, the randomization, the placebo control, the blinded reporting, the quantitative perfusion analysis have allowed us to look at this in a perhaps more bias resistant way than has has been previously. And we have now got some insights into what might be happening in terms of myocardial perfusion. There's lots of intermediate, you know, intervening steps between the introduction of a coronary sinus reducer and a benefit in subendocardial perfusion. And I don't think we yet understand what those steps are. And that's where there really is a space for, for future study, I think. Yeah, and you did have quite a lot of imaging endpoints that I'm sure will uh, yield a lot more data. Um, Rashi, if, if I might ask, because this is not the regular Orbiter trial, it wasn't PCI, it wasn't a procedure that everybody has the expertise to do. Uh, how many patients exactly, I think you targeted 50, but how many patients did uh, you randomize? And could you speak to the challenges of running a trial where you require specific expertise? And I believe you probably had to have a proctor at every case as well. Yeah, so exactly right. So there were 51 patients in this trial. Um, it's obviously still in our stable coronary artery disease space. Um, and the reason we designed this trial was because we saw this device with a mechanism that was not intuitive, with a pre previous placebo controlled trial, and a device that's out there and in Europe has been uh, able to be used for some time, but that wasn't being used. So the question was, is it not being used because we don't understand how it works? Or is it not being used because we don't believe it works? And so that's why we did this trial. Now, obviously, in trying to think about that, we started with the mechanism of action as being the important question, because for us, we felt that was one of the major barriers to working out whether we should use the device. Um, and in powering it, we obviously understood that at around 50 patients, we'd have power to look at MRI endpoints. Um, we were actually, it was unexpected to us to see symptom benefit but that's maybe some of the power of our symptom app, the Orbiter app, because we get daily symptoms every single day that improves the sensitivity for us being able to see differences between groups and a change in a group. Um, but you're quite right, it's hard to find these patients and recruit them into a trial. And Mike did a fantastic job and so did our investigators on looking for patients who we often have in our clinics and they're kind of lingering in clinics without treatment options, or even discharged from clinics because we don't have any treatment options for them. And in fact, in two years was able to find these patients. And interestingly, when you give patients a treatment possibility and they're patients who are this symptomatic, uh, we found that they were very, very willing to be part of a placebo controlled trial because they wanted to hopefully have a treatment that made a difference. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I guess, uh segues on to the last question of, of based on the data that we have now from this trial which patients what's the message you would give to the interventional community which patients should we uh, attempt to use a coronary sinus reducer on and also we do have uh, chron chronic coronary syndrome guidelines being updated this year at the ESC do you reckon there'll be anything changing in the guidelines as well 
Yeah, so I always, I mean, with the answer to the guidelines, I always say it's for the guideline committee. You know, they have to, that's an impossible job and a very difficult job of synthesizing the data we have. But what I would argue is that we now have a third treatment option for patients with refractory angina, because that's the population we, we studied. Um, and we have placebo controlled evidence, so the highest level of evidence for those patients. What I think is also important to remember, if, if you're the guideline committee and for us as clinicians, is that refractory angina is um, a kind of undefined term, right? When do we decide that there are no more options? And when do we decide this is the point for another option? And it might be um, that you think, actually, there's a balance of risk here. There might be another interventional option in terms of PCI or a redo cabbage or whatever it might be, but the risk of that might be so high that you think it's worth trying a procedure that has lower risk and see if it works and that doesn't stop you from doing something else in the future if you need. So there might be a wider application to patients with potential you know, CTOs that would need high risk PCI, lots of diffuse disease that's difficult to treat. And so I think there's a wider application in the trial, what we did was we had an MDT that decided with a, a group of interventional cardiologists who are used to uh, complex coronary artery disease and treating that, and obviously also uh, surgeons who had told us up front clinically that they didn't want to operate on these patients, we made the decision that this was now a refractory patient. And I think that's probably how it would be, you'd be used in clinical practice. You have to decide locally that there's no further options or that those options have very high risk. And then you can consider whether this device might be the next step. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's very nuanced which patient you would potentially consider this a suitable option for. So thank you very much for doing the trial. We look forward to the next uh, thing in the Orbiter series, I suppose. Uh, and thank you for if taking the time. You don't get bored of them. No, no, we don't. <laughs> I'm sure you don't, but thank you very much uh, for taking the time for this. And uh, this will be simultaneously published in The Lancet, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. You'll see it on Monday. Yep. Thank you so much, both. And uh, the rest of the international community, make sure you follow PCR Online for further coverage from ACC Scientific Sessions 2024. Thank you.